Inside many pockets, touched by many hands, this coin's travelled far and wide over many lands. The Bow Street Hoard comes from the site of a hotel development in Bath, and uh, work was in progress on that in 2007, and uh, that's when the hoard was found. But uh, uh, that was in the course of uh, what was uh, a fairly conventional archaeological excavation. One Friday morning I'd finished what I was doing and um, was sent to investigate a corner of a, a wall and uh, started to trowel away and found a coin and not long after found another coin and then another coin and then another coin and um, yeah we realised there was something you know pretty special because it was a Friday we didn't want to sort of uncover all the finds and leave it over the weekend because you know you've got to protect this sort of thing. And we covered it over, hid it and then came back on Monday very excited about what might be there. It was really not a very nice day at all. It was cold. I think it was um, you know autumn time. It wasn't very pleasant. It sort of you know worked at cleaning around what we'd found on the, the previous week, cleaned it all up, took lots of you know photographs um, to sort of for the archaeological record for the archive. Uh, when we realised the size of what we were dealing with, we realised we couldn't um, just lift it out easily. It was, it was heavy, it was big, um, the rain wasn't helping either, it was, it was slippery to, to deal with. Um, so we realised we'd have to clean around the, uh, the block of coins um, and try and lift it out. So myself and my colleagues, there were about yeah, six of us, um, spent most of the day cleaning it up very well. Um, and then lifting it bit by bit and pushing a, a piece of wood underneath it, which we then put, uh, managed to attach to some uh, ropes. We attached that to the machine and that was then lifted out. You then got to wrap it really tightly so it doesn't, so you've not got coins sort of dropping out everywhere onto people's heads and stuff. Yeah, so it's wrapped really nicely and uh, yeah, take, take it ready to take to the British Museum. I didn't realise at that time that uh, this might be something of any great significance. Because when it was first discovered, uh, the hoard was uh, believed to be just a modest number of coins. And it was only later, quite a long time later, that the full extent of the hoard was properly appreciated. In the con normal context of archaeological discoveries, most things from the site were coming to the Roman bars anyway. And uh, that was all uh, signed and sealed and so on. But uh, uh, because the hoard was defined as treasure under the Treasure Act, it had a slightly different process. In 2009, I had a telephone call from a curator at the British Museum, Richard Abdi. And uh, uh, Richard phoned me up and said, uh, uh, we've got a hoard here from Bath with, uh, uh, it could have somewhere between 30 and 60,000 coins in it. And the significance of being told that is that the largest hoard ever found in Britain has 55,000 coins in it. So here was this man telling me on the phone that this hoard might be the largest ever found in Britain. The big surprise was when the block was x-rayed and we could see that it wasn't just a big solid mass or lump of coins but in fact several uh, bags of coins. And indeed there were eight bags. So is it actually one hoard or is it actually eight hoards? To me the significance is circumstances of its uh, discovery which has enabled us to look very closely in very scientific terms at how the hoard was deposited arranged and sorted. If we look at the coins in it, uh, we find that those eight bags only contain two types of coins, uh, silver denarii and silver radiates. So they've been heavily selected in the first place. When you look at the date range of the hoard, the oldest coin is from 32 BC and the youngest from 274 to 5 AD. So that's a range of over 300 years. It means that uh, when that last coin was put in the hoard, there was a coin in it that in our terms would have been like a coin of Queen Anne. It's pretty old. Uh, and the hoard is unusual in having quite a large number of fairly early coins in it. Most hoards are more compact in terms of their date range. 
in terms of size, the Bow Street Horde is a big horde. There's, there's no doubting that. It's certainly not the biggest horde of Roman coins found in Britain. So it's, it's not particularly the size. It's the, the fact that it is, it is an archaeological context and it is uh, a very carefully sorted and arranged um, group of money bags. Coin finds are rarer in the centre of Bath, with the exception, of course, of the great sacred spring, which was discovered in the 70s and 80s. And it yielded about, about the same number of coins, about uh, 15,000 odd coins. Um, but that is a different sort of find. Um, and it's important to realise that coins can be built up in one particular area, not just by somebody carefully hoarding uh, their own funds, but by uh, coins being built up over centuries, over years and centuries, um, uh, uh, as offerings in, in the case of the Sacred Spring. So that's a case where you have a very large uh, assemblage of coins which isn't a hoard, and you'd have to say this is something that's been built up over a long period of time by different people, and therefore wouldn't qualify under the Treasure Act. But the, uh, the Bath Hoard is obviously something that's been moved from the contemporary circulation at one point in time, maybe give or take a couple of decades, but they've been withdrawn from circulation with the specific intention of um, concealment. So that's uh, you know, one question we can ask about it. Uh, but there are other questions too. Uh, why is it only silver coins that are present? of those silver coins. What are they telling us about the coins that might have been in circulation at different times? Uh, when they're subject to metal analysis, uh, you can uh, see that the silver content of these coins is changing very rapidly over time. The, the uh, third century is a period where the, the fineness of the silver coinage is diminishing over time, and the earlier good silver coins are put in some bags and then the poorer silver, the very base coins, are kept separate in other bags. So there's very careful sorting going on and the whole impression is it's a carefully managed treasury that has uh, been built up, perhaps over some time, but certainly it's been built up and carefully arranged as maybe, um, maybe some sort of paying out of monies going on and then there's more money coming in, but the good silver is again being saved one side. So there's some sort of treasury, perhaps from a, a, um, a, you know, a high status house. So there's quite a lot of uh, numismatic uh, interest and scope for discussion um, that uh, can be explored through the Bow Street Hoard. It's offering a window into the world of the first of the third century and some of those political and economic events that were taking place then, of which otherwise we don't have very much knowledge. Although it wasn't automatic that the hoard would come to the Roman baths, after all, the British Museum under the Treasure Act has the first right of refusal. Um, it was uh, nevertheless always the most likely outcome because uh, uh, the British Museum normally waives its exclusive right in favour of the local museum. Um, however, it did mean that uh, uh, in order to receive that, we did have to raise uh, £60,000, which was the value put on the hoard by the Treasure Valuation Committee. And then we would need some further money to actually mount a display in the museum. And if we just settled for that, uh, I think most people would have thought, you know, that's good, it's a great thing to have done. But uh, uh, we felt actually it was a rather special thing to find and rather interesting and gave a great insight into uh, what is really quite a fascinating period in Bath's history. And so we, we wanted to build a bigger project around it. And so we spoke to the Heritage Lottery Fund. Well, the Heritage Lottery Fund is one of the good causes which is funded by the National Lottery so every 20 uh, pence that the National Lottery gets through selling a ticket, some of that money comes to the Heritage Lottery Fund. And we're the largest funder of heritage across the whole UK. And um, the heritage is very diverse, so it can be things like buildings and churches and castles and museums. 
but it's also canals, activities, um, oral histories, traditions. So it's a broad range of projects that we fund throughout the UK. We then worked with Bath to look at uh, the details that we'd need to see to get the project really shaped up, doing consultation with different uh, groups within Bath, like Genesis, Bath Spa, uh, University, um, and really nail down the details of what the money would, would pay for. So it's really important that it's not just about sort of conserving the heritage, which is incredibly important, but to ensure that people can understand uh, more about their heritage and, and learn why it's important will help protect it for future generations. If people understand why it's um, significant to our past, then it's very relevant to you know, who we are today as well. Uh, and the National Lottery money, it's people's, you know, pay their money for their tickets. Uh, so it's the public's money. So it really is important that for all of our projects, uh, it's about widening participation to as wide a range of people as possible. Um, and also through heritage projects, there's lots of opportunities for people to learn skills, which can help with employment opportunities. And again, it's really making sure that our money's working as hard as it can to look after the, our heritage, but also to help people and communities have a, have a share in what's happening and understand why it's important that we carry on looking after our heritage for future generations. When we go to our committee for their decisions, we have a case paper. And in, in that case paper, it sets out the project and what they're hoping to achieve. And one of the outputs that they were wanting to do was a film about the project. And that's obviously happening, which is great. There were a number of, I know they were working with Genesis, uh, the Homelessness Trust, um, older people within the community taking things out to schools. So there was quite a wide range of engagement, both older and younger generation, um, BAME groups, uh, British, Asian and minority ethnic groups. So it was a real... Um, focus on trying to look at who doesn't visit the Roman baths at the moment and it does have a very significant number of visitors but actually that's quite a lot of tourists there's a lot of people in Bath who don't necessarily go there and think it's for them um, so what was quite exciting about the project is using the hoard as a way of drawing in people from local communities old and young. One of the principal objects uh, of the project was of course always to uh, create a permanent display in the museum that is not a straightforward task. The Roman Baths Museum has uh, uh, been developed quite extensively in the last five or six years. And uh, uh, in doing that, we've had a rolling um, redisplay and development program, where one of the things that we've been very keen to ensure is consistent uh, design so that it doesn't change each, each year um, in response to the current year's work, that we maintain consistent standards throughout. Now, in doing that work, we've uh, uh, done it through a long-term contract with Event Communication. And uh, their designer, Daniel Warren, had uh, worked on the display space that we identified for the Bow Street Hoard. Uh, just a few years ago. Well, events became involved down at the uh, Roman Baths in 2006 when we were awarded the project to uh, help them reinterpret and redisplay their collection. Luck luckily down at Bath, they, they know their audience very well. They're, they're an experienced team who've sort of, you know, they've been, do they've been doing this for many years. And so they know that they have an in international visitors, uh, families, children all the way up to, to adults uh, with a keen historical interest, but also plenty of visitors who will be on day trips. This project was one that would be quite challenging because uh, although there are lots of coin displays in Britain, they're actually, from a curatorial point of view, one of the most difficult kinds of objects you can possibly display. They're very small, you can hardly see them, uh, if there's writing on them, it's in a language that people don't understand. Uh, the, where there is imagery, it's not always obvious to people what the imagery is. It can be quite obscure in its meaning. So we wanted a display that would start to unlock some of the secrets, some of the stories that can be told about the hoard. Yeah, so the, the Bow Street Hoard display itself... Um we, we kind of knew where it needed to fall in the museum 
pretty quickly. It had to, had to go in that gallery, really. That gallery was all about um, people who lived in the town of Aquasulis, as it was known then. Um, so as this coin hoard was found just down the road, it, it needed to be in that gallery. As chance would have it, we already had a small display talking about coins from the uh, across the Roman Empire and mints, which was which was interesting, but um, not as interesting as this new display. So then um, we had to think about how we're we going to tell the story of this, the discovery of this coin hoard, as well as showing really as many coins as we could. You know, the the, the amazing story about this coin hoard is the the sheer quantity that were found, and the fact that um, they were excavated professionally and still intact within their individual bags that they would originally have been buried away in the floor. It has to be something that people can engage with uh, actively and uh, certainly if it's going to be of interest to a wide range of people. So uh, the dis display called for a range of different things. We wanted to include film that told the story of the discovery uh, we included tactiles uh, uh, that replicated the original bags. Um, <coughs> there's a, a laser scan of uh, one of the uh, bags of corroded coins. Um, and then there are the coins themselves. Of course, we couldn't display 17,000 coins. That would be, um, be, a big, be a big job. And also the... Uh, the museum staff themselves need to catalogue all of these coins. Each of them has been individually numbered and photographed. And they need to keep a track of, of where they are um, and to be able to, to get hold of an individual coin. And in displaying coins, which are flat two-dimensional objects, um, people can appreciate them far better if they're beautifully lit and actually trans translated into 3D objects. And so that was the obje our objective in the case display that we established. We, yeah, we didn't want to have the coins just sitting there static on shelves. It seemed a little bit, uh, it's been done before and it's not, not particularly engaging. We wanted everyone to have a good, good look at them. So the, the space available was, a, was really a vertical wall. So mounting each individual coin and bringing it forward so that it's, it's pretty close to the visitor we picked, out, um, we picked out one or two with a magnifying glass that you can look at the, the detail and some, some groupings of kind of star coins or interesting groupings so there's a little story to be told about each of those. So again it's kind of, in, it's kind of information is fairly light, we didn't want people to be um, spending minutes at a time there. Hopefully you'll, you'll spend sort of 30 seconds looking at the case, there's a short film, runs to about a minute to the side telling the story. People will watch that and then they'll, they'll move on to the next, uh, next display. And actually, in doing the hoard, we weren't just doing the showcase because we had agreed with the lottery fund that they would also support the uh, installation of a new lift so that uh, we're now in a position where 90% of the entire Roman bath site is accessible to people in wheelchairs. We actually ended up with a project that didn't just acquire the hoard and display it, which is two actions. We ended up with a project that actually had 33 different actions. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, that was more than we originally anticipated by quite a long way. but. Uh, uh, when you're thinking up ideas of how you can creatively uh, use a resource like this, um, the, uh, you can rather get carried away, actually, with all kinds of uh, opportunities and possibilities. Uh, an awful lot of the work we have done is, has been fundamentally educational. Uh, it's involved uh, people in formal education, but it's also involved lots of informal learning as well. Um, we tried to use the coins creatively to do things that uh, uh, aren't just about classics and history. Um, we've used coins uh, as the basis for maths projects. After all, if you take a large quantity of coins and put it on a table in front of someone and then watch what they do, it's only a matter of time before they start to count them. I think the significance for us as a school and for a teacher is doubly so really because it's a fantastic excuse to really get our hands dirty with some history detective work. We have 
have the opportunity to actually pass these coins around and the children have a chance to look at the coins um, with a magnifying glass and hold them. To hold one of those coins is actually holding something that one of the Romans um, from this area held in their hand. It gets it gets all of us to start thinking about those individual people rather than the Romans as just this obscure period in history. One of the most wonderful reactions from the morning session that we've had with the Roman Baths here today was the, the dinner bell was going and they did not want to leave. They were so excited about handling the coins and then when they realised that they could maybe beat the historians, maybe find out something the historians had missed, they clearly lit up at that as well. There were lots of wow moments this morning. I think it's been a really fantastic session. In putting this project together, uh, it's only happened uh, because uh, lots of other people and organisations have been willing to work with us. They've been very tolerant and uh, uh, I think it's uh, very appropriate to thank some of those organisations. Inside many pockets, touched by many hands, this coin has travelled far and wide over many lands. I was carried in a leather pouch amongst many others. I wonder what's become of my little silver brothers.